For many years, scientists, researchers, and physicians have been poking around in the dark crevices of the gene, trying to untangle genetic mysteries. What alters gene activity in humans? What changes the way our brains work? There is a term called epigenetics, which some scholars believe will prove more important than genetics for understanding environmental and other causes of disease. It is my pleasure to welcome neuroscientist and psychiatry professor Dr. Anthony Phillips, senior investigator at the UBC Brain Research Center, to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hello. Hello. Delighted you to be here. You wear another hat, too. You, you work at the Canadian Institute of Health Research. That's right, CIHR. And that's uh, comprised of 13 virtual institutes, and I'm the scientific director of the largest of those institutes, which deals with neuroscience, mental health, and addiction. That's why you know what epigenetics means, or yes. one of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Well, it's a relatively new term. Uh, you know, cast our minds back about a decade when Tony Blair and Bill Clinton appeared on the lawn of the White House announcing that we had finally cracked the, the genetic code mm -hmm. for the human genome. And uh, one of the implications was that we would immediately know the cause of many important aspects of ill health. Well, it turns out that that was only part of the, uh, of the, of the uh, solution. Uh, what was missing in that announcement was the fact that the three billion uh, base pairs that make up the human genome are in turn regulated by marks that are left on the genome, uh, and that's called epigenetics, the code that lies above the genetic code, epi being above. Mm, epi being above, yeah. above the genetic code. I'm yeah. still a bit confused. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll take, <laughs> take me uh, step by step. Okay. Who coined the term? Do you know who coined the yes, term? Yes, a man called Waddington in the mid-50s. But it, philosophically, it's been around for hundreds of years. And some of your um, viewers might know about the French philosopher Lamarck, who claimed mm. that the, the experiences we have in our life can affect our genome. And, of course, Darwin and others have really poo-pooed that idea, but uh, there are elements of that idea that actually uh, reappear in, in epigenetics. Mm. Uh, so would epigenetics be on side with Darwin or not? It's certainly on side with Darwin because the, if we think of the genetic code as being the, the book of life, mm -hmm. all of the information that we need to make a human or any other life form, that's categorically Darwinian. What epigenetics does is it brings another dimension to this, and that is it helps to explain how you read the book of life and how the experience you have in your life uh, and in your interaction with the environment determines which chapters of that book will actually appear in your life or my life. So, example, okay. uh, prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. Uh, doesn't get much to eat, experiences extreme stress, mm -hmm. fear. Yep. If you're an epigeneticist, mm -hmm. would you study how that changes a, a POW's brain or not? Well, you'd, see, you'd study how first how it affects the genes of that individual. Mm. And there are uh, natural experiments uh, that occurred, uh, you know, much in the same way that you're, you're describing. There were formal experiments done on a population living in northern Sweden in the late 19th century. And this was a remote community that, that experienced repeated famine and then, uh, mm. and, and then plenty. And they had such a, an exquisite record of both the harvest and the health of those people that they could link the, the, uh, the, ac the access right. to food to their health. And what they found was that in periods of plenty, uh, the offspring of uh, parents that experienced plenty after famine had a higher incidence of diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease in future generations. Mm. And that caused people to go looking for the factors that might explain how those life events could, could impact the gene of an individual and thereby affect their health. Okay, so because of the extreme from the famine to the plenty, from the plenty to the famine, yep. Something's happening in our body, physically and mentally, or just physically? Well, first of all, it's a physical change. Okay? Sure. And it affects the, the makeup of the brain. There's, a, if I may, a, another wonderful experiment done by Canadian researchers at McGill University. And what they studied was the influence of 
uh, good mothering on the health and, and uh, viability of the offspring uh, mm -hmm. of those rat mothers. Mm -hmm. And the mothers that, that uh, nurtured the pups uh, well uh, were much more able to cope with life stress than the offspring of mothers who just gave minimal attention to, the, mm -hmm. to their pups. And then what they've done subsequently is to show that that early mothering affects the, the um, activity of the stress hormone systems in the body. So if you mm -hmm. had a mother mm -hmm. who, a, as a human, mm -hmm. who uh, could not or would not nurture you, mm -hmm and you weren't embraced uh, as a baby or a child, mm -hmm. would that alter your brain chemistry or your genes well, or Well, it would what? first, according to this theory, and again, mm -hmm. this theory. is an experiment done in animals and we have yet to prove that it transfers to humans, but the assumption is that that early mothering, uh, proper uh, nurturing uh, experience does affect the integrity of your stress hormone system by changing specific genes. And the gene that it alters in the rat is the, it's called the glucocorticoid receptor. So when, when our stress hormones rise, release from our adrenal glands, mm -hmm. they come into the brain, they affect glucocorticoid receptors. And that in turn uh, registers the stress in the brain. And so if you can regulate the receptor, you can regulate your response to stress. And so animals that were poorly mothered had uh, less, fewer of these receptors and were less able to regulate their stress response and therefore adapted uh, poorly mm. to life. So if you studied a rat mm. who could uh, accept stress, uh, sail through, or a yeah. human right. who seems to just sail through, mm -hmm. uh, experiences extreme trauma and they've done research as you know on, yeah. on POWs who, right. who get through still with a healthy attitude, who live long. Yeah. So what changes in the human? Well, in this, in this example, I mean, you're, you're um, bringing up a, a really important issue about resilience. Mm. So how is it that some people can cope well with stress and others uh, have more difficulty? Uh, without going into their early life experience, it may just be related to how the stress hormone system is regulated by these glucocorticoid receptors. Mm. Now, again, that's a, another theory, uh, but, it, but it's one that's un sure. under review. But it's important if you're looking at any kind of mental illness or uh, addiction. Yes. There's no question that early life experience, especially if you have severe trauma in your life, can predispose you to later depression. Um, and, and, and not mm -hmm. everybody, because as you just said, some mm -hmm. people are resilient. But there's no question that these early life events raise serious difficulties for many individuals right. later in life. It's saying to me, and this could mm. be true or not, that DNA is not necessarily our destiny. Precisely. And this, now we bring, cycle the conversation back to epigenetics because here again we have a way of changing the way in which the genetic code can be read by early life experience. Mm. If I can just go into this a little more deeply, mm -hmm. one of the issues uh, about DNA is um, its complexity, obviously, there's three billion bits of information in there. But also, in every cell in our body, we have a piece of DNA. And we have over a trillion cells. <laughs> and if you were to eke out the piece of DNA in each cell, mm -hmm. it would be six feet long. And if really? you link all that together, you could lasso Pluto with all the DNA in your body. So every cell has a packaging problem. How do we put six feet of DNA into a single cell? Well, we do it by wrapping the DNA around little proteins called histones, and it's all tightly packaged. And then that packaging determines which aspect of the gene can be accessed by things called transcription factors. So if you can open up the, the packaging, right. then you expose genes to being read. If something were to happen that kept that, little, that chapter of the, the Book of Life closed, that gene would not be expressed. And those openings and closings and the marks put on the, on the genetic code are the uh, keys that determine which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And those can be influenced by environmental factors such as elements of your food, stress as we've been emphasizing in the conversation, mm. and, and, and other uh, significant events. The air we breathe, the chemicals we well, take in. Yeah, not, not everything. That I mean, far? You're, yes, I mean, if you're exposed to very serious 
toxins, mm -hmm. then that's going to affect uh, how these marks uh, lie on the sure. genetic code. And whether or not it's mm -hmm. reversible, or is it reversible? Well, this is the really exciting part of this, and that is that it is reversible. And these, uh, meth they're called methyl groups, so it's one way of marking the, the uh, genome, is simply putting a methyl group on the outside of the genetic code. Uh, and then they can be uh, placed or replaced. Uh, right. And that mm -hmm. can change the way in which the code is read. Why do I think you got A's in organic chemistry? I just have well. a feeling. <laughs> uh, Professor uh, Tony Phillips, our, our guest, he's a brain function and behavior expert, a renowned expert on brain function and behavior. We'll come back.